Well, why don't we get started? We've got a few more people just connecting in. So I want to welcome everybody. Uh, once again, this is our third and final public lecture for the CRC Tier 2 candidate selection. Um, today, we're very uh, fortunate to have Hadi Khalil. Um, Hadi uh, is based in Switzerland. He did a postdoctoral fellowship with Jeffrey Mulkerton in Cincinnati, and since that time, he's now doing, he's a research associate actually in the experimental cardiology unit in the Department of Medicine um, at the University of Lausanne um, Medical School in Switzerland. And um, Hadi is going to give a uh, public lecture for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, that will leave us a little bit of time for some questions. Uh, from the public so we would urge you to please send in those questions uh, through the chat line and I'll help um, moderate uh, the questions at the end. Just would like to remind everybody as well if you could please keep your microphone on mute uh, during the presentation and ideally turn your video off so that we can focus on uh, Hadi. So Hadi if you just want to unmute yourself now We want to make sure that uh, make sure that we can hear you okay so again uh, welcome uh, we're really excited to hear what you have to say really excited about your work thank you. and um, I'll pass the microphone over to you now so why don't you go ahead thank you very much I really appreciate giving me the chance to give this presentation happy Easter everybody I hope you are all safe in this epidemic uh, so let me just share my screen please tell me if you can hear me well I can hear you very well. Okay, perfect. So uh, today I'm going to share with you uh, the work that I have done on the, uh, studying the myofibroblast function. Uh, most of the first part of these studies has been done in Jeffrey Malkentins, as discussed. Uh, the rest of the part of the work has uh, been initiated in Lausanne. So uh, the presentation is going to be uh, three parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to start discussing the fibroblast to myofibroblast activation, their role and function. And finally, I will touch down a little bit on the heterogeneity. Uh, the heterogeneity part is going to be my future work. So uh, I would leave most of that for the discussion uh, later in this afternoon. So uh, it's very important to uh, perform the cardiovascular uh, research, as you can see in these statistics. Uh, up to 800,000 people die uh, every year in the United States from uh, cardiovascular complications. So uh, uh, with all the research and the success we have, we still have to do a lot. And therefore, uh, it's important to understand the uh, major uh, causes of the uh, cardiovascular diseases. And this is probably because of the limitation of the cardiac uh, regeneration. Uh, we all know that the uh, embryonic uh, uh, heart can regenerate. Hadi, I'm just gonna ask you to stop for one second. Sorry to interrupt. We can't see your screen yet. Do you wanna okay. maybe work on that? Yeah. Let's confirm we can see, I'll see your screen before yes. you get going. Yes, I'm gonna do that again. So I'll, I'll share it again, probably it didn't allow. Share again. Do you see it now? There we go, yeah. Okay. So why don't you go back, to maybe just start over from the beginning. Yeah, from your okay. Title. So, okay, so this was the first slide. Let me just remove this. Maybe go to presentation mode on your PowerPoint. Yeah, all good Perfect. here. Perfect, okay. looks great. Okay, so uh, we all know that cardiovascular complications uh, are uh, the cause of the highest number of deaths. And this is uh, what I've said uh, in the previous slide where around 800,000 people die in the United States every year uh, from cardiovascular complication. And therefore, uh, it's important to focus on uh, the causes of the uh, cardiovascular diseases and how can we limit that. Uh, we know that uh, the major part of the cardiac diseases is because the cardiomyocyte uh, upon uh, uh, being uh, released from the moment of the, uh, excuse me, uh, after birth, uh, the cardiomyocyte exit the cell cycle and therefore they uh, quit the proliferation process. Uh, therefore, uh, we can clearly see that in the neonatal hearts, uh, uh, they, these hearts can regenerate with the minimal uh, amount of scarring formation from the extracellular deposition matrix. Uh, while in the adult hearts, uh, because of the uh, cardiomyocyte uh, not being able to proliferate, these are replaced by extracellular matrix scar. Uh, we call it fibrosis, in addition to uh, the fibrotic uh, cells, the fibroblasts. 
So uh, it's important to focus on uh, these fibroblasts. And uh, I will be uh, going through this with you to describe that uh, the fibrotic process, uh, whether it takes from uh, a level of uh, replacement fibrosis uh, or what we call that these cells are replacing the myocytes uh, upon injury like myocardial infarction, where there's a massive death of the myocytes, uh, or in the process of the reactive fibrosis where in conditions of uh, hypertension and uh, pressure overload, uh, in both situations we will have an excess formation of the extracellular matrix. And uh, this is produced mainly by cardiac fibroblasts. Back in the days, we did not have markers for uh, cardiac fibroblasts. So what we knew about these cells, uh, and we defined them, these are uh, the stromal cells that uh, reside in the connective tissue of an organ. And then uh, uh, these cells uh, do not share any markers with uh, non-vascular, like uh, vascular tissue or epithelial tissue or inflammatory cells. But uh, these cells are needed for the hemostasis of the tissue uh, or in the heart, uh, because if we wipe them out, the heart fails. Uh, but uh, what is very well known is that they are responsible for the generation of the extracellular matrix and reshaping and maintaining this extracellular matrix. So uh, uh, most of the cardiac fibroblasts, uh, uh, in fact, come from the heart. Uh, there were previous theories about uh, the conversion of the cardiac fibroblasts from other uh, cell types, but this turned to be uh, minimal uh, in the studies that we performed on other people too. So what happened to a fibroblast during injury? It transforms into a form of activated fibroblast that ended up by what we call myofibroblast. Uh, the markers that we know so far are handy, like not too many. Uh, for example, I will talk about the transcription factor uh, 21 uh, and about the periostin. These are two uh, uh, gold standard uh, markers of the fibroblast nowadays. So uh, when I joined the, the lab of Jeff uh, we were developing this uh, periostin merkremer animal that we, uh, we used to study activated fibroblasts. Periostin is a matricellular protein that plays a role in reshaping of the collagen and the extracellular matrix. It's induced after stress, specifically in the fibroblasts. But it's also expressed in other uh, tissues, like in uh, kidney, in the skin as well. Uh, uh, periostin also expressed in the uh, skeletal muscle, and we have studied this uh, protein as well, and we have seen that its induction is due to uh, injury. Uh, the other protein that I will touch down is the uh, TCF21, the transcription factor 21, which is a mesenchymal marker that is expressed originally that found in the kidney, but also uh, labels the cardiac fibroblasts at the level of their quiescent state, so uh, without an injury. So these two uh, uh, markers has been used to generate uh, animals in order to uh, uh, study by lineage tracing uh, the cardiac fibroblast. And uh, I'm not sure if I have to go uh, very deep here, but I'll just quickly describe how the model works. So under the control of the TCF21 promoter, uh, there was inserted the uh, Merkremer, so it's a modified estrogen receptor that is responsive, uh, responsive to the tamoxifen. So whenever the activation of the TCF21 promoter takes place, there will be this generation of the uh, Merkremer. Uh, in the presence of the uh, tamoxifen, there will be uh, activation of the CRE and therefore excise uh, the LOX P sites. In this uh, scheme here, the LOX P sites are uh, stopping the expression of the tomato. And uh, once the activation takes place, we can see clearly the uh, labeling of these uh, very beautiful uh, fibroblasts in the heart. Uh, the expression of these uh, fibroblasts has been used now, and, and we could use the, the, this model in order to manipulate the fibroblasts. So uh, this is the second model. It works pretty much the same, but this is under the control of the periostin promoter. And now there is one level of uh, uh, complication on top of this, that periostin promoter is induced by injury. So therefore, we have to induce injury by, for example, myocardial infarction or uh, transaortic constriction for pressure overload or angiotensin PE. And in the presence of tamoxifen food, uh, we can clearly see that uh, this model is very uh, efficient in labeling uh, all the uh, cardiac myofibroblasts in the heart. So uh, we did, as I said, uh, this uh, similar uh, characterization in the lung as well as in the skeletal muscle. And in, in both uh, of these organs, we were able to uh, uh, trace and uh, study the fibroblasts. 
So the first question was, uh, what, what would be the role of uh, uh, conversion of a fibroblast to a myofibroblast? And here we, we uh, decided to study the fibroblast specific TGF beta signaling. Why TGF beta signaling? Because it's one of the uh, most studied cytokines and it's known to uh, play a role in the fibroblast conversion. So uh, I'm gonna place this working model here and I will go back and forth every uh, few slides just to add more information. Uh, showing that in the heart, uh, we were focusing on uh, the interplay between the fibroblasts, the carbomyocytes, and the extracellular matrix. So uh, the fibroblasts uh, supposedly producing the extracellular matrix. Uh, the extracellular matrix uh, harbors a lot of growth factor and cytokines that may, might play a role in, in to the carbomyocyte. And uh, probably this is going to affect the uh, carbomyocyte function. So. Uh, we decided to go first to this GF beta based on literature because back in the time in uh, around 2010, 2011, we didn't have the markers for uh, uh, the cardiac fibroblasts. So people were using the alpha myosin heavy chain promoter in order to knock down proteins in the heart and mainly in the cardiomyocytes. But these two studies here uh, showed that the knockdown of the TGF beta in the cardiac uh, myocyte, although uh, it had an effect on the pressure overload by uh, having less hypertrophic response, uh, uh, however, the heart fails uh, by uh, the excessive amount of the fibrosis that has accumulated throughout the experiments, suggesting that the TGF beta is playing on the non myocyte fraction. And therefore, we decided to knock down the TGF beta with the periosteum. Uh, uh, Cree line and the TCF21 Cree line in order to, uh, uh, to decipher the effect of the TGF beta on the fibroblast itself. So uh, the TGF beta is a complex uh, cytokine family. It has a three ligand TGF beta 1, 2, and 3. These normally uh, induce the activation through the double receptors here. There's the canonical and the non-canonical pathways. I'm not sure if this showing up for a correct on your screen because part of my screen is hidden with the, with the video. Uh, so what we, where we focused is on the canonical pathway on the SMAT23. These are the transcription factors that induce the myofibroblast genes upon activation. So, uh, so we add the TGF beta into, uh, into the model here. Uh, we want to see if we delete TGF beta, what will happen for fibroblast to myofibroblast activation. Uh, so we took this long uh, genetic approach by uh, obtaining the SMAT2, SMAT3, uh, the double receptor, uh, TGF beta receptor 1 and 2 fluxed animals uh, that were crossed uh, uh, either single or double to the periosteum uh, promoter. Uh, 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 transgenic animal, sorry, and then uh, in the presence of the ROSA26 uh, GFP so that we can label these cells where we knocked on the SMAT3 and the double receptors. Uh, for, uh, when we started the experiments, we were trying to understand the, the role of the SMAT2 versus SMAT3, but then we uh, uh, decided to shut down all the canonical uh, pathway and uh, the total uh, TGFP beta pathway, and this is achieved by the, uh, the activation of the receptors. Uh, performing these experiments, we use the pressure overload as, as a model, uh, TAC, transaortic constriction, uh, with the tamoxifen food for four or eight weeks. So I'm going to ju just show part of the results here. So uh, first, we tested if we were able to knock down these proteins uh, in, in vitro by uh, uh, adenocree. So we obtained uh, uh, fluxed uh, 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 fibroblasts from SMAT2, 3, uh, or receptor 2, and we see that efficiently we deleted these proteins upon Cree activation. Uh, and then we looked at the functionality of these uh, proteins uh, by the gel contraction assay. Uh, our first experiment showed that SMAT2 does not really affect the uh, contractility of the cells in the gel contraction assays. Uh, however, uh, deletion of SMAT3 or the receptor uh, uh, 1, 2 had uh, uh, abolished the activation process of the fibroblast, suggesting that these two uh, proteins play an important uh, uh, role in the activation of the fibroblast into myofibroblasts. Uh, then uh, we all know that uh, fibroblast to uh, manipulation in, in the culture is, is really difficult. So we repeated this experiment in a setup uh, where we uh, induced cardiac uh, uh, over pressure overload. And then we obtained the fibroblast directly uh, from the uh, control animals uh, like the periosteum uh, ROSA 26 GFP or in the uh, double knockout. And uh, we, then we cultured these cells directly to see that 
they are predisposed to uh, stress uh, even before we isolated them. And clearly we see in the image uh, in the panel B that uh, the cells obtained uh, with the G GFP marker uh, in the wild types, we have uh, a clear stress fiber formation uh, uh, suggesting their activation state, while uh, the GFP positive cells obtained from the SMAT23 cells are not activated and they look like quiescent cells. Uh, further, we uh, went forward and checked the function uh, of uh, the TGF beta signaling pathway uh, on the fibrotic levels by looking at the myocardium. And uh, again, uh, deletion of uh, SMAD2, as we see in, in this panel A here, uh, deletion of SMAD2 did not have any effect on the myocardial fibrosis compared to the controls. However, deletion of SMAD3 or SMAD23 or the double receptors, uh, one and two uh, abolished totally the myocardial uh, fibrosis. And uh, here we, uh, we also repeated the experiments with the TCF21 Merkramer. So uh, we already deleted, so the difference between the experiments that uh, with the perostin Merkramer, this is a continuous process and the feed in of the cells uh, as the injury happens, the activation process takes place and the deletion of the proteins. However, with the TCF21, we already deleted the proteins uh, like SMAD3 or the double receptors or the double SMAD23 uh, even before the process of uh, injury takes place. And in both conditions, we obtained the, the similar result of uh, minimal fibrosis in, in, in those uh, uh, models. Now we also assess the cardiac function. And uh, here we get the, our first surprise that uh, deletion of the SMAT2, uh, uh, as we expected, did not have any effect on the uh, systolic function, SMAT3 as well. SMAT23 did not have any effect on the systolic function. However, uh, the double receptor knockouts has sustained the, the function of these uh, hearts, uh, suggesting that TGF beta uh, knockdown at the level of the receptor is more efficient in uh, minimizing the, not only the fibrosis, but uh, the uh, cardiac function uh, sustainability. Uh, another thing we tested is the uh, cardiac hypertrophy, and this is uh, correlated with the uh, increase of the uh, uh, the decrease of the TGF beta uh, receptor one and two had led to uh, minimal uh, hypertrophic response. And uh, finally, we looked at uh, the the function of the heart at the diastolic level, because uh, this might be an easier way to look uh, since the fibrotic responses uh, might uh, greatly affect the uh, contractility and, the, and that can be reflected here uh, by the fact that uh, uh, the SMAT2 and 3 or the SMAT3 alone did not have any effect on the diastolic function while the release of the SMAT, uh, the double receptor has sustained uh, a better diastolic function. So uh, uh, the information we got here uh, suggests that the total shutdown of the TGF beta signaling is required uh, to uh, obtain a better hunk uh, heart function after stress. Uh, so finally, we uh, looked at the uh, possible uh, mechanisms that uh, play a role in, in, the, in the cardiac fibroblast activation. So we obtained SMAT23 uh, GFP cells from the hearts after injury, and uh, we counted those compared to uh, the wild type animals. And what we found uh, was that the number of the total uh, SMAT23 uh, knockout cells was much lower. And uh, this was uh, mainly because the proliferative capacity of these cells was uh, downregulated. And finally, we uh, performed RNA-seq analysis in order to identify signaling pathways that uh, has been altered. Uh, we were not surprised to see most of the extracellular matrix proteins and uh, proliferative uh, genes that were downregulated in the SMAT23 double knockout, uh, in addition to uh, some of these integrins that uh, play a role in the uh, cell cell communication. Uh, now, uh, we performed the same experiment as well in double receptors. And uh, what we found is a pretty much a similar profile, but it was a wider range where most of the uh, extracellular matrix proteins were downregulated. Uh, but in addition, there were uh, certain genes that were up or down regulated in the double receptor knockouts that was not really uh, shown in the SMAT23, suggesting that some of these genes might play a role 
in uh, the beneficial uh, function that we see in the double knockout uh, hearts, in the double receptor knockout hearts, but not in the SMAT23 knockout hearts. So with this, uh, we come to the first conclusion that uh, TGF beta is playing an important role in uh, fibroblast to myofibroblast activation. And if we block TGF beta in these cells only, uh, we will be able to minimize uh, the extracellular matrix generation. Uh, but whether that would be affecting the uh, cardiac hypertrophy is depending on the magnitude of how much we block the TGF beta. Uh, the double receptor would lead to a lower hypertrophy while knocking down only the canonical signaling of TGF beta did not really uh, uh, lead to any cardio, cardiac uh, hypertrophy responses. So uh, other questions that came in, uh, at the end of this study was uh, what would be uh, the cell type that generate of the most uh, the TGF beta that plays a role of these pathological conditions? Uh, the difficulty of this question is that TGF beta ligands are secreted factors. And uh, once they are generated, they are residing as uh, dimers of uh, uh, cytokines in the extracellular matrix uh, that are uh, quickly activated by protease activation. And therefore, it would be difficult to trace which cell would produce the majority of the TGF beta during the injury. Uh, uh, we know also that inflammatory cells produce a lot of TGF beta. Uh, other reports show that TGF beta is produced in fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. So uh, the question here was, uh, uh, to, to answer which uh, cell type produced the majority of these TGF betas. So here I took a very long and laborious uh, uh, route in order to identify the source of the TGF beta in the heart. And uh, what I did is to cross the TGF beta ligand one, two, and three flux flux into uh, either the alpha myosin heavy chain promoter. So to knock down these uh, three proteins together in uh, the cardiomyocytes or uh, with the TCF21, uh, which uh, will lead to the knockdown of the TGF beta 1, 2, and 3 in the fibroblasts. Uh, uh, during that time, I have in development the kit CRE and lysm CRE for uh, the TGF beta ligand in the inflammatory cells. Uh, but what I have obtained is some preliminary data here that was uh, pretty surprising that uh, when we knock down the TGF beta only in the cardiomyocytes with the alpha myosin heavy chain, as we can see in these two panels here. So this is the control alpha myosin heavy chain, and this is the alpha myosin heavy chain with the TGF beta receptor knockouts. Uh, after two weeks of tamoxifen injection and the knockdown of the proteins, the heart uh, fractional shorting uh, drastically dropped. And this was associated with the increase in the cavity, as you can see the dilation in, in the heart. However, Knocking down the TGF beta in the fibroblast did not have any effect. So we followed up these, uh, these mice up to nine months without any uh, effect in the fibroblast knockouts, suggesting that uh, the cardiomyocytes are really the major source of the TGF beta in the heart. And uh, generating this TGF beta might be uh, the major storage uh, of, of the TGF beta in, in the extracellular matrix. And uh, upon activation, this will uh, really favor fibroblast to myofibroblast activation for the process of the ECM generation. So with this, I, uh, I will finish up with the, with the first part of the, of the project. Uh, another thing that came to my mind is to uh, check on the extracellular matrix generation, but in conditions with, which is cleaner that uh, down regulation of TGF beta because we might have affected multiple genes and therefore we looked for something more elegant. And here we came across the HSP47, the heat shock protein 47, which is a chaperone that is specific for fibrillar core lesions. And uh, it has been shown by a group in Japan that uh, knockdown of the HSP47 is, is, is playing an important role in uh, uh, forming these misfolded uh, proteins. And uh, uh, the work from uh, Ishi Nagata in Japan has shown that uh, HSP47 is even more specific uh, chaperone for collagens, uh, but not other proteins. So uh, we took the approach to use the HSP47 flux flux animals in order to knock down uh, uh, this chaperone in the activated fibroblasts. So we will have a condition where uh, after injury, the myofibroblast will be 
convert it into myofibroblast, it will be generating all the growth factors and uh, proteins like alpha smooth muscle actin, uh, but not uh, uh, the, the, the collagen. So we will have a myofibroblast with a collagen-free uh, generation compared to a myofibroblast that can generate uh, the ACM. And uh, what we wanted to do is first to uh, check the activity of these uh, cells. So we obtained HSP47 flux flux. We hit them with the CRE and we obtained uh, a complete uh, reduction of the HSP47 protein. And in the media, we tested uh, the amount of the collagen that is secreted and we, we could see the downregulation of the collagen secretion. And then we took the approach to knock down the uh, HSP47 and before the collagen synthesis in not only one cell type and in three uh, cell types in the heart. Because uh, cardiomyocytes during the, the development, uh, they need the collagen one uh, during the process. So uh, therefore, uh, also cardiomyocytes were reported to generate the collagen four. Uh, there were also reports that endothelial cells produce the messenger RNA and the proteins of the collagens. So uh, we, uh, we created the knockout with the uh, uh, three different Cree lines in order to see which cell type will affect the major uh, collagen component uh, expression in the extracellular matrix after injury. Uh, we also produced uh, uh, these uh, mice, as I, I explained, so the TIE 2 Cree for uh, endothelial knockouts. Uh, the alpha myosin heavy chain for the uh, cardiomyocytes. And what we obtained here is that we uh, just seen a minor uh, down regulation in the generation of the collagen one in the uh, type two knockouts in the endothelial cells. Uh, however, in the cardiomyocyte using the alpha myosin heavy chain or the beta myosin heavy chain knockouts, it, we did not see an effect on the, uh, on the collagen generation. However, uh, as expected, a knockdown of HSP47 in uh, fibroblasts, in the activated fibroblast with the usage of the periostin Merkumer animal, uh, uh, we could clearly see a down regulation in the, in the levels of collagen 1, 3, and, and 5, uh, suggesting that, as expected, the, uh, the fibroblasts are the major source of the collagen after uh, injury. Uh, we also looked at uh, the total fibrotic responses and uh, we measured the heart function. Uh, so uh, this is the second model where we see that loss of the extracellular matrix or minimizing the deposition of the extracellular matrix had uh, led to uh, lower hypertrophic responses, uh, uh, not necessarily leading to any uh, systolic uh, uh, benefit, but again, uh, better diastolic function probably uh, due to enhanced contractility. And finally, we, uh, we tested uh, these uh, uh, HSP47 uh, knockout uh, by uh, counting the number. It was reported that HSP47 uh, deletion uh, leads to increased cell death. And probably this uh, had led to a lower number of these uh, activated fibroblasts and therefore lower uh, uh, deposition of the extracellular matrix. This was one of the possibilities. Another possibility, we tested also the proliferation and we found out that there is less pro proliferation of these uh, fibroblasts. So uh, multiple uh, reasons could be behind that. One of them is that uh, either fibroblasts themselves uh, upon activation need uh, signals from the extracellular uh, matrix. And if these signals do not exist, therefore uh, the fibroblast will uh, stop the activation process. Uh, here we tested in vitro and in vivo uh, the activation of uh, the profile of the uh, uh, HSP47 knockouts. And uh, what was very surprising to us is that not only uh, HSP47 led uh, to decrease in the fibrillar collagen uh, gen uh, generation, but it led to a down regulation of most of the extracellular matrix proteins. Uh, exceptions for that, uh, as expected, like uh, alpha smooth muscle actin and vimentin were not changed, but most of the collagens were downregulated. And there were some compensation mechanisms by upregulation of proteins like tennessin C in the extracellular matrix. And this was also verified in the uh, whole heart uh, after uh, the transaortic constriction uh, model that I described earlier. So with this, we can conclude that uh, uh, the fibroblasts are the major source of the uh, extracellular matrix generation. 
And this extracellular matrix is keep feeding back to uh, the cardiomyocyte as well as to the fibroblast to maintain either the generation of uh, the ECM protein or uh, affect the hypertrophic responses in, in the cardiomyocyte after pressure overload injury. Uh, we repeated these experiments also in uh, knockouts of the skeletal muscle, and we obtained similar results by knocking down in the fibroblast, but not in the myofibers. We could minimize the uh, level of the fibrosis in, in animals after injury and in uh, delta sarcoglycan knockout animals. So uh, to summarize these two parts together, uh, cardiomyocytes are the major source of the TGF beta in the heart. TGF beta is quickly activated uh, to induce fibroblast to myofibroblast activation. Myofibroblasts generate most of the extracellular matrix that is needed during the process of uh, the cardiac injury uh, that would might play a role in the activation of the hypertrophic responses, as well as the feedback loops that keep feeding the uh, extracellular matrix uh, generation uh, till the end of the injury and the scar formation. And uh, open questions are still about the role of the inflammatory cells in the level of the TGF beta at the hemostatic uh, point of view and at the injury uh, time. And how would uh, the inflammatory cells play a role in the reshaping and uh, remodeling of the extracellular matrix during the injury and after the injury. So uh, one thing I want to uh, go across is the fibroblast heterogeneity. Uh, so from our work and previous work of what I have shown you here and other people uh, who uh, published a lot of uh, papers about the process of activation of these resident fibroblasts into myofibroblasts. Uh, these resident fibroblasts share certain markers that we are sure now that, uh, for example, the TCF21 is uh, highly expressed in resident fibroblasts. However, like proteins like periostin and alpha smooth muscle actin are uh, really uh, minimal or not expressed. Uh, upon injury, the activation process passes by intermediate stages that we, we, we don't know what are the markers of these intermediate stages, uh, but we see a fluctuation of these markers by, for example, uh, loss of the uh, TCF21 and the start expression of the periostin and alpha smooth muscle actin, uh, then leading to the final stage where the myofibroblast is fully activated and leads to the generation of the extracellular matrix here. And here we can see activation of uh, alpha smooth muscle actin and periostin and total loss of the TCF21. This is so, uh, so far is very well documented and well known. However, what happens from this point up after the re uh, relief of the uh, scar formation, uh, what happens to these cells is that most of these cells die. And that's why when we do the myocardial uh, uh, checkup at uh, the level of, the, for example, tunnel analysis, most of these cells around the fibrotic tissue are dead fibroblasts and uh, inflammatory cells. But what I will be focusing in the next few slides is about uh, uh, how to understand more what happens to the myofibroblast up after the level of the activation. Uh, do these cells deactivate? And if they deactivate, what would be the status of the extracellular matrix? Uh, are we able to um, uh, manipulate these cells in order to uh, uh, downregulate the levels or, of the extracellular matrix or remodel it? Uh, would these cells go back to the intermediate stages or would they uh, go back to the levels of the resident fibroblast uh, stages? And what would be the, uh, the status of the communication between uh, these deactivating uh, myofibroblasts uh, and the inflammatory cells in response to uh, uh, the existing extracellular matrix that has been deposed? So uh, uh, very quick, I will touch on uh, the long encoding RNA as a model that we can use in order to study the heterogeneity. So if I go back to this slide, it's super clear that we have markers for these fibroblasts, but as we can see there, these fibroblasts are uh, uh, very heterogeneous. So in order to study those uh, fibroblasts better, it's uh, probably uh, we need to focus on more finding markers that identify fibroblasts in one tissue versus another or in one stage of activation versus another. And here uh, I, I, uh, I get to be interested with uh, studying the long non coding RNA. So if we look at the human genome, only 2% of uh, this genome is uh, uh, coding protein coding genes. And uh, the rest of the, uh, non, uh, of the genome is a non-coding genes. Uh, so I'm not gonna go to uh, describe the classification of these non-coding genes. 
they are uh, divided in majorly two two parts. Uh, the most interesting for me here is the long non-coding RNA because of their high tissue specificity. So uh, this is uh, the the process that uh, I I might be interested to study in the future uh, in order to understand the heterogeneity of the fibroblasts. So uh, long non-coding RNA play uh, uh, a role in different ways. Uh, they could be signal uh, uh, molecules. They can be de decoying molecules. They can guide uh, be, be a guiding molecule for transcription. They could be a scaffold for uh, for uh, the the gene activation. And uh, the most importantly, they can be enhancers, so they can induce the expression of of genes or. Uh, uh, activate uh, genes. So if we take these uh, long encoding RNA uh, into consideration, uh, looking in literature, uh, the literature is, is getting uh, more and more in, interested in, in this uh, uh, domain where uh, every other uh, day we see uh, another long encoding RNA has been described and in, in the heart particularly, uh, a long list of long encoding RNA has been described to play a role in the hypertrophy as well as in uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, commitment. So. Uh, here I'm going to share with you uh, one of the current experiments that we have, and uh, uh, what we did is uh, to obtain uh, uh, hearts after injury with a myocardial infarction. Uh, three days after myocardial infarction, the hearts were isolated uh, after enzymatic digestion. We obtained uh, the non-myocyte uh, fractions. Uh, then we obtained from in this experiment here uh, the the alive cells the alive and active, metabolically active cells. And, and then we depleted the CD31 and the CD45, suggesting that all the cells that do not express uh, the CD31 and 45, the negative ones would be uh, the cardiac fibroblasts. And uh, then these were barcoded and uh, uh, followed by 10x genomic sequencing, uh, single cell analysis, and then uh, bioinformatic analysis. And uh, what we obtained in uh, these results here is that uh, pure clustering of the fibroblasts after uh, three days in uh, sham operated or uh, myocardial uh, infarction operated animals. And uh, what was uh, uh, very nice is that uh, in the myocardial infarction, we had uh, three clusters of cells that were described to be uh, uh, separated from all the other cell types. So uh, the image that I was showing you about the intermediate stage of the myofibroblast is kind of uh, illustrated here because most of the uh, fibroblasts uh, after myocardial infarction or after sham operation, they mostly share similar clusters. However, these three clusters were only uh, uh, in the myocardial infarction uh, suggesting that these are the activated myofibroblasts. So now we also looked at markers, uh, protein coding gene markers like collagens, like periostin, like uh, alpha smooth muscle actin, which were uh, expressed uh, very nicely in these uh, three clusters. Uh, uh, also, uh, we looked for protein like TCF21 loss, which uh, was downregulated uh, after myocardial injury as expected. Uh, what was also interesting is to look at the long non coding RNA uh, or the Lincoln there. And uh, we identified one of the long non coding RNAs that is expressed in only two out of this, these three clusters. Uh, what was interesting about this long non coding RNA, it's uh, more cardiac fibroblast enriched compared to the cardiomyocytes. And uh, looking on uh, data that has been published by Enzo Porello, uh, which he has performed uh, myocardial infarction on animals at three days or after uh, eight weeks of age. And uh, he looked at uh, the transcription profile of the four different cell types, the cardiomyocyte, the fibroblasts, the endothelial cells, and the leukocytes. Uh, we found that uh, this link RNA is expressed mainly in the activated uh, fibroblasts in the adult setup. But, uh, what was even more interesting is that uh, uh, this uh, induced uh, long non coding RNA uh, not only uh, expressed in the uh, in, is, is only expressed in the heart, but not expressed in other uh, tissues. 
and uh, with a very minimal expression in the lung. So suggesting that uh, a long non-coding RNA might play an important role in, identify in identifying subclusters or subpopulation of cardiac fibroblasts that is normally hidden within the global uh, fibroblast uh, that we normally see uh, if we take RNA sick. So uh, with this, I will uh, simply uh, summarize all uh, the information that I've shown in my presentation. I go back to this activation deactivation process. Uh, so now we can add uh, one of these markers. Also, we need a lot of uh, characterization of this long non-coding RNA, but we know that it's induced after uh, activation in culture after uh, culturing fibroblast. It's uh, induced with the myofibroblast activation. Uh, what would be uh, the uh, role of this uh, long encoding RNA and uh, if we can use this as a therapeutic marker or uh, if we can block it down by uh, oligosense, uh, uh, non-oligosense uh, uh, usage, uh, this would be uh, a lot of future work that is coming. Now, what I will be focusing in the uh, afternoon talk is about the deactivation process. So uh, let me just uh, describe this in few minutes. How many minutes I do have? So one more minute. One more minute just to describe this uh, for the people who will not be in the presentation. Uh, in fact, so uh, most of my future work will be uh, focusing on the deactivation process. And uh, what I will be studying here is the, uh, the deactivation of the fibroblast to uh, the myofibroblast into uh, less activated after injury. Uh, I have a lot of information from obtained from the periostomer crumor animal that showed the deactivation process. And uh, there is a model in the human uh, uh, clinics, which is the left ventricular assist devices, uh, which has been published uh, by SADIC group uh, in Texas, showing that the left assistant devices induced uh, proliferation in the cardiomyocyte. And therefore also other people showed that the decrease of the amount of the collagen generation in the, in the process where uh, we unload the heart. So I'm going to use the unloading of the heart as a model in order to study the deactivation process of the cardiomyocyte uh, of the fibroblast. And I would uh, be uh, looking at the profiling of the fibroblast and the inflammatory cells by single cell analysis, both at the protein coding and the non-coding uh, after the resolving, resolving of, the, uh, of the injury. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I would be very... Uh, uh, glad to thank everybody that has uh, uh, played a role in this uh, in this work, uh, mainly the lab of Jeff Mokentin, where all the genetic studies has been uh, taken place, uh, and the long encoding RNA part, which uh, I performed in the cardiology department in the University Hospital in Lausanne. And I would be very happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalil. That was really fascinating. Um, thank you. I've been studying fibroblasts and the matrix and fibrosis and heart function for many, many years. And I can definitely attest to the fact that you're asking some of the most important questions in the field and using some very cutting ed edge techniques to investigate them. So congratulations on that work. So I'm gonna open uh, the floor now for questions. So if uh, people who are watching want to submit their questions through the chat line, I'll be happy to um, moderate those. We do have a question from Professor Childs. She says, nice system, exclamation mark. One downside of links and miRNAs is that their functions and targets may not be conserved across species as much as protein coding genes. Yes. Is this, um, is the one that you study conserved to humans? Is this a concern in general focusing on links or is there better conservation of function than I think there is? So uh, if the question is regarding the link that I'm looking for here, uh, this we tried to find a homologous in the, in the human, but we did not find. But this was the highest expressed one. That's why uh, we started studying. But we have others on the list that we can really follow. But I agree, this is uh, one of the most difficulties. If we want to go for any therapeutic approaches uh, in the future with the uh, antisense oligonucleotide, uh, this is the first thing to check if there's a homologous in the human. And that's why I focused on uh, my next studies in doing the human fibroblasts as well as the uh, uh, mouse fibroblasts in order to identify 
the the links that are really expressed in the heart of a human probably there would be more uh, promising in order to find any any therapeutic targets thanks for the question this is a uh, great question by the way yeah great um i'm just waiting for some more questions to come through uh i think oh here one that just came through so this is from professor hollenberg he's asking what is the time frame of the activation and what might be the role of MMPs and TIMPs in the activation deactivation process? Yes. So uh, the process of activation. So here, here we have to uh, to think about the activation in two different ways. If we are talking about the in vivo analysis, it's going to be uh, somewhere about about uh, six hours to have the first markers of activation. Periostin itself it fires up in six hours. However, if you uh, think about the activation in, uh, in culture dishes, this is way different because the shear stress we put on the fibroblasts is like thousands of magnitude compared to what the cells uh, behave or what the cells have in the heart. So uh, the role of the, just, just if I cover this part well, if I would say the activation process in, uh, in, in vivo is around six hours, the total activation process of a myofibroblast, it takes about 24 hours. So that's what we have seen. If you hit a heart with an injury, within the next 24 hours, there will be GFP positive cells that have started expression of the alpha smooth muscle actin. And then the process uh, uh, continues with uh, additional markers like periostin and down the road uh, in 48 hours, I would say the fibroblast is fully active. Now, uh, the role of the TIMPs and MMPs. This is a very, uh, very interesting question. Uh, one thing I was trying to, to understand is what is the role of the MMPs and TIMPs in terms of the fibroblast activation itself? And in order to answer this question, I looked on uh, neonatal fibroblasts versus adult fibroblasts. Because normally neonatal fibroblasts, they don't see signs of activation. However, uh, adult fibroblasts, they show quick signs of activation. And what was really surprising is that the, the, the expression of MMP3, for example, and TIMP1, they are not existing in the, the neonatal fibroblasts compared to the adult fibroblasts. So uh, practically, uh, TIMP1 and uh, MMP3 uh, are really uh, one of the gold standard markers that I would be focusing on in the process of this activation process in the future. Excellent. I noticed in your uh, presentation, you talked a little bit about uh, TGF-beta, you know, obviously being a, a major player. Um, and there's TGF-beta 1, 2, and 3. And yeah. we mostly focus on TGF-beta 1. And when yes. we talk about TGF-beta, it's often just TGF-beta 1 we're talking about. And you did specifically talk about 2 and 3. And I wonder if you could tell me what your thoughts are. What are the differences between those Three and do they have the same functions? Because my understanding is that possibly TGF beta three could even be an antifibrotic agent. Exactly. So uh, uh, most of the questions that we get on the TGF beta answered is from the classical knockouts that we had from the TGF beta. So the TGF beta one, two, and three has been knocked out separately from animals. Uh, the studies were focused mostly on the TGF beta one because it's only not only profibrotic but also it also uh, calls on the inflammatory cells for activation as well. So there is a feedback to the inflammatory cells, and there the, the interest started there. Too many people started studying uh, on the, the TGF beta role, but TGF beta uh, TGF beta one knockout animals, for example, they are viable, and the loss of the TGF beta has led to a massive inflammatory response in these animals. So it, it looks like it's not only pro-fibrotic, but also plays a role in minimizing the levels of the inflammatory disease at the end of the injury. Uh, TGF beta 2 uh, animals uh, are not viable. Uh, and the, the TGF beta 2 uh, is lower expressed compared to TGF beta 1 in the heart. So what I've done so far is uh, characterizing the levels of the expression uh, by the cardiomyocytes because I was focusing only on that in, in the project. And I've seen that the expression levels are mostly uh, TGF beta one and uh, uh, TGF beta two and three are lower expressed. 
Uh, now back to the TGF beta 3 that it plays an uh, uh, antifibrotic role. I did not really detect this because uh, uh, in conditions where we uh, knocked out the TGF beta on the myofibroblast, we, we did not we did not see really any uh, any effect on their uh, profibrotic activation. So I don't know if this is related uh, also to, to the amounts that I have used, but that could be the case. Great. This question comes from uh, Professor Rose. He says, I enjoyed your talk. My question pertains to the applicability of your findings to different regions of the heart. There's some evidence that fibroblast and myofibroblast function or phenotype in the atria is distinct from the ventricles. Have you considered this in your studies? Uh, we did not study extensively the atria, but I uh, strongly believe that the myofibroblast activation is regional. I agree with that because, uh, and it also depends on the type of the injury. Because in the myocardial infarction, these cells rush very quickly and proliferate uh, around the area of the, of the loss of the cardiomyocytes uh, in order to avoid the rupture of the heart. In the pressure overload, this is totally different because the pressure starts around the vessels and that's where the fibroblasts start to, uh, to have this effect of the proliferation generation of the ECM in order to support these vessels. Uh, but I totally agree that uh, the atrial fibrillation, for example, might be related to uh, a profibrotic uh, lesions that is generated in the atria that we've never really studied. One of my colleagues was performing TGF beta overexpression, and we detected uh, due to the overexpression of the uh, TGF beta that circulates, we could see uh, the express the the. Uh, how to say the dilation of the atria, but we didn't know what really was the, the major cause of that. Okay, great. Um, this is just a follow-up from Dr. Hollenberg. He said, and he asked you about the activation and deactivation patterns. Yeah. And he said, you spoke about the activation being 24 to 48 hours, but yeah. what what is the time frame for this deactivation process? Maybe there's lesser known about that. Yeah, so this is, this is less known and this is also depending on the magnitude of the injury. So in a myocardial infarction, this is uh, the deactivation process takes up to 56 days in animals that we tested. Uh, it starts around 28 days after injury. Uh, however, uh, if you use the uh, angiotensin PE within two weeks, you can see the deactivation process. In other words, I have uh, or already profiled um, fibroblasts after two weeks of angiotensin PE and then two weeks after uh, the removal of the angiotensin PE pumps. And already there, we could see the deactivation of the periostin, the alpha smooth muscle actin, and the uh, loss of the MMP3. This next question comes from Dr. Patel. He says, thank you for your talk. Are the myofibroblasts generated in different types of cardiac injuries or insults um, in a similar way? Have you considered comparing the myofibroblasts and their RNAs generated in myocardial ischemia versus pressure overload induced by biochemical stress in the TAC model? Okay, we have not done this experiment, but this is really interesting because I, and I fully uh, agree on the fact that the type of the injury dictates what type of the fibroblasts activation would, would be. Because uh, if you, uh, let, let's just uh, quickly describe how the myofibroblasts behave in the myocardial infarction. Uh, the first thing they would do is that because the ability of the generation of the collagen is gonna be slower due to the fact that this collagen has to be generated, secreted, assembled, this needs longer time compared to uh, proteins like uh, in, this, uh, in the alpha, alpha smooth muscle actin. So the fibroblast very quickly uh, activates the alpha smooth muscle actin expression so that it can obtain this phenotype of contractility as well as uh, uh, having this macrophage like in order to fill the holes. But uh, during the, this is the first phase of activation, I would say. Then uh, it leads to uh, the activation of the uh, collagen synthesis and the day down of the extracellular matrix. And therefore, the cells, they don't need any more uh, the alpha smooth muscle actin. Now they rely on the extracellular matrix that is uh, deposited outside. So this is how it, it acts with the myocardial infarction. Uh, and the proliferative process should be very quick. 
within within the day uh, two to day five of the myocardial infarction, the proliferative capacity should be, uh, I would say, uh, 10, 15 folds higher. With the pressure overload, this process happens, but in a lower magnitude scale, it's slower because it's adaptive with the increase of the pressure around the vessels, that's where you would see. And therefore the localization of the cells is totally different between the interstitium versus the perivascular. And therefore the communication with the cells at the site of the injury uh, of the myocardial infarction area, it's gonna be more with the inflammatory cytokines compared to around the vessel, which would be endothelial cells, fibrocytes. Yeah. Excellent. I want to ask you another question that was on, on my mind. Um, one of the things we're doing in my lab is we're using some extracellular biologic extracellular matrix and we're putting it on the epicardium of the heart after injury. And we're seeing that it really alters the fibroblast phenotype yeah. and results in reduced fibrosis, increased vasculogenesis, and improved function. And one of the big questions we've always had, but we're not capable of answering it, is what is the role of EMT in all of this. And I noticed that one of your collaborators is the world expert in cardiac EMT. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you've investigated EMT at all or what your thoughts are about its role in uh, cardiac fibrosis after injury. The epithelial to mesenchymal uh, uh, transition, uh, it's something that I really did not, uh, did not study in my experiments. Uh, but in other tissues, not in the heart, uh, for example, in the kidney, the EMT plays a major role in the conversion of these TCF21 uh, marked uh, fibroblasts into uh, myofibroblasts. Uh, if, you, if you consider the slide that I showed in the beginning of my presentation from, uh, from uh, the paper from Malkin Teens that, uh, that we published, we obtained multiple Cree lines uh, in order to uh, test the EMT uh, during the injury and very minimal of these cells per, uh, were obtained from the EMT uh, process. Uh, only around uh, three to four percent out of the total amount of the fibroblast came from the EMT. But most of those were mainly TCF21 resident cells that actually activated into uh, the myofibroblasts. Uh, with the t uh, with the perostin, uh, so I would I would minimize the level of the EMT process uh, in in the heart. I wouldn't really focus on that uh, based on these uh, lineage tracing studies. Okay, excellent. What do you think? What's the role of um, immune cells in interacting with fibroblasts and fibrosis? Is there an important role there? Do you think? Uh, definitely, because uh, the immune cells are known to generate a good amount of the TGF beta. Uh, this is one of the cytokines that uh, comes to my mind. But other, others, for example, the MMPs are also generated with the macrophages. Uh, that's, why, that's why my focusing on the deactivation process, I should take into consideration both fibroblast and the, uh, and the, uh, and the macrophages. And that's that's exactly uh, the question you are asking. If the cells are playing a role in the fibrotic process, I don't think uh, macrophages are needed to generate uh, the ECM, but they play an important role in reshaping and remodeling the ECM. And this is something we did not study yet. So that, that's, that's where we would focus. And again, coming back to the MMPs, the MMPs that are generated with the macrophages are known to uh, play a role in the, uh, the ECM uh, remodeling. Then one of these, uh, I have a full profile program, I can show it in the, in the afternoon, uh, profile of the MMPs that uh, down or upregulated after uh, the deactivation process. And that's, that's why I get interested into studying the, the macrophages as a source of these MMPs. Great. Okay, well, I think that is all the questions that we have so far and that brings us to one o'clock so dr khalil i want to uh, congratulate you for your talk it's really thank well you. done congratulations for oh wait we've got one follow-up just just came in uh from dr patel he said did you indicate that the myofibroblasts in the tac model would be majorly i majorly i think he says from the endothelial to mesenchymal cells no, they would not. They would not be majorly from the endothelial to mesenchymal cell. Some of them would be because of the uh, activation process. It starts around the vessels. And that's if there is a 
because there is uh, around uh, I would I would say around up to four percent of these fibroblasts coming from this process, and since in the TAC injury, uh, the sites of the pressure overload start at the uh, around the vessels, uh, most of the fibrosis starts there, and then spreads out to the interstitium, but not the majority of the cells come from the EMT. Okay, excellent. So thank you so much for your uh, public lecture today. We look forward to following up with you at three o'clock yeah. this afternoon with the panel. And I want to thank all of the participants uh, for um, dialing in and, and listening in and providing yeah. questions. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. I hope you're safe. And uh, I really thank you again for giving me the chance uh, to give this lecture. And uh, have a good day. Thank you. Our pleasure.